from Tokyo, Japan. I'm having a blast here. It's the best. And um, today I want to talk to you about Gypsy Jazz from the perspective of a beginner. So the title of the video might seem very clickbaity, but I have a good excuse for this. You may notice that I'm wearing headphones. That's because I'm monitoring the audio over here just to make sure nothing goes wrong because I don't have my assistant with me. And um, before I start, I need to make a few announcements. First of all, this is going to be a long video and I had to organize my thoughts. So I'm kind of looking at my iPad here to read my notes. So sometimes it looks like I'm reading from the iPad, but my speech is kind of improvised. It's the way I like to do things. Announcement number one. Next month, in the month of March, from March 12th until March 15th, there will be the Taipei Gypsy Jazz Festival. It's going to be a lot of fun and flights are super cheap because of the coronavirus scare. But don't worry, it's actually really, really, really safe in Taiwan and it's a unique opportunity to, to fly to Taiwan for very cheap. I will be performing with Duved and his Transatlantic 5. I'll be playing bass and we'll be uh, officially releasing the, the physical album that we just recorded a few months ago. And uh, you can also check out the album on iTunes, CD Baby, even on YouTube Music, I believe. Not only is it going to be a lot of fun, but it's, it's, it's a unique event because in Asia, there's very little gypsy jazz. And this is the only festival in Asia that really tries to invite people from all over Asia and elsewhere, of course, to come and participate and ha join in on the fun. There'll be jam sessions and uh, workshops and a concert on March 15th. So come check it out. I also want to thank my sponsor, AT Guitars. This is one of the very best guitars I've ever played, uh, made by Atsushi Takano here in Japan in Tochigi Prefecture. Uh, this guitar is absolutely, absolutely amazing. Ah, oh, yeah, beautiful. I mean it though, this, this guitar is absolutely incredible. I fell in love with it. I uh, tried it for the first time last year when it was fresh off the bench and I didn't stop thinking about it. And then when I came back to Japan um, this winter, I asked him if he would sell it to me and he agreed. So thank you very much. This is the guitar I'll be using in Asia. I'll leave this, when I go back to uh, Montreal, I have my Makta Tombly, which I love as well. But this guitar I'll leave in Asia. So basically in this video, I want to advertise a new series of uh, online lessons that I created, not for my DC music school, but for Sound Slice. This actual video that you're watching on YouTube is self-contained, but it will refer to a lot of the materials that I cover in the online lessons. And just in case you don't know who I am, I just introduce myself. My name is Dennis Chang. I'm originally from Montreal, Quebec, the province of Quebec in Canada. And uh, I don't know exactly where I live because I'm always on the road. Right now I'm in Tokyo. I love it here. And uh, well, the long story short is I'm the owner of DC Music School. You can check out the YouTube channel, uh, check out the website. I've produced lessons for so many artists like uh, Pat Martino, Ulf Akenius, Birelli Lagrand, Stokl Rosenberg, pretty much everyone in gypsy jazz, but then also in like mainstream jazz and different instruments, all that stuff. And uh, yeah, that's who I am. Many people have been asking me over the years to create a lesson series for beginners. And um, I never got the time to do this until recently. So here it is. I'm directly releasing this on SoundSlice, which is an amazing, amazing platform created by my friend Adrian Holovati. Um, I'm not releasing this on DC Music School because it doesn't really fit the vision that I have for DC Music School. Uh, so that's the reason why. And by the way, um, these YouTube videos take a lot of time to make. They also cost me money because I have a team working for me. And you may notice that these YouTube videos are, of course, free. I don't have anything like Patreon at the moment. So if, if you enjoy this content, it really makes a difference if you like, you share, you subscribe, and you click on that little bell, bell not notification. And uh, if somehow you, you want to support me, then consider maybe consider buying the, the, the beginner lessons. Check out the, the description for the link or something from DC Music School. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now let's define what I mean by beginner because beginner means different things for different people. My uh, definition for beginner here is someone who's been playing the guitar for, I don't like to say this, but let's say three years kind of seriously. And if you play guitar kind of seriously for three years, chances are 
technique wise you know all the basic major minor chords like g major bar chord well the cowboy chords for c d e a and then minor and also bar chord shapes should be fairly easy for you and uh, as far as left hand strength goes like maybe you should be able to do a d13 chord which is this five four five five seven starting on the a string five four five five seven that's d f sharp c e and d if you can do this technique wise and it's like no problem or very not too difficult anyway then technique wise you sh this is for you this is what i consider beginner and then as far as picking technique is concerned like single notes if you can take a like a pentatonic scale and play it at this speed would can define this as like the minimum requirement for my uh, beginner course if this is what you can do technique wise then you're a perfect candidate and of course the, the the better you are then the more you can get out of it quicker but I designed this course with such people in mind now as far as knowledge is concerned like um, theory and harmony all that stuff you don't need to know much or anything just maybe know the names of the notes on on the guitar or be able to find them relatively quickly uh, you don't need to know any theory you don't even know how, need to know how to improvise I've taught I've been teaching this style for so long I've taught people from scratch so I know exactly how people progress it goes without saying that the more you know the more the easier it gets so I always encourage that you to seek out information wherever you can this uh, beginner series can also be very good for people who are interested in teaching this style of music and teaching this target audience. Maybe you can get some stuff out of this. Please feel free to use my material. I really don't care. I'm happy to share. But maybe credit me if, if possible. So one of the first things I want to say is that I don't believe, I don't have a particular system for teaching because I don't believe in them. That's because I think everyone is different. Everyone learns differently. I've noticed this uh, through over the years from workshops and teaching private lessons. That said, I have very um, specific views about what I consider to be basic musician sk musicianship skills that I think every high-level player should, should strive to have. But how you achieve these skills will uh, inevitably vary from person to person. Some people are very natural, you can call them talented if you want, but other people will have to maybe learn some music theory or go through another way, I don't know, using sheet music, tablet or whatever. It doesn't matter how you, how you get there, the, the important thing is that you actually get there. Basically, what works for one person may not work for the other. So feel free to experiment. So about this very bold YouTube title, Best Beginner Gypsy Jazz Lessons. What? How dare you? Let me tell you why I use this title. Because the first lesson I'm going to teach you is to go check out every teacher in the style or out, not even just in the style. In general, talk to everyone. Go check out my buddy Christian van Hamer. You'll have the link um, off the top of my head. Uh, who else is Steve? Robin Nolan, cool guy. Uh, what else? Ah, Yaakov Hotter, my friend from Israel. And uh, what else? Who else is teaching this stuff? Uh, Clément Reboul in France. Yes, that's Selmer 607. Check everyone out. I, I, I encourage everyone to, to, to keep an open mind, to ask questions, to question everything that you're told. Like, I don't want to say that mine is the end-all be-all system no it's not uh, I want you to find your own truth and that's why I use this title best gypsy jazz lesson ever because the lesson is to go check everyone out I think this is very important because for me I equate jazz to artistic freedom and one of the first rules of jazz in my opinion is to find your own style and you find your own style by checking everyone out 
you experiment and you discover things. I consider myself to be a perpetual student and a beginner. I know exactly what it feels like to be a beginner and why is that? Because every number of years I, for some reason, I start to study a new language. Now I've, uh, I, I grew up speaking Taiwanese. Um, then because I live in the French part of Canada, I grew up speaking French. Uh, English came naturally because I watched a lot of television, played a lot of um, video games with English uh, text. Uh, eventually I went to school. We had to study German for like six years. I don't speak it, but I understand it. I wouldn't say fairly well, but I, I can understand some German. And then at one point I learned Mandarin Chinese. And then because I hang out a lot with uh, Sinti musicians, gypsy musicians, I even picked up a little bit of their language. Now I'm like intensively, intensively studying Japanese. So I know exactly what it's like to be a beginner. And even in the, in the musical side of things, I've been practicing violin and uh, bass for the past three years now. So all the frustrations that you guys feel, I know exactly how it feels. I've been to so many different teachers for different things. I've encountered really, really bad teachers, really good teachers and everything in between. And I just want to say, don't be afraid of bad teachers or bad advice. Because if you, if you keep this open mind that I encourage you to have, eventually you'll find your own truth. And I say your own truth because truth can sometimes be, be subjective. I have mine. I know I can defend my positions fairly well in a debate. You might say I'm a master debater. And um, if you keep an open mind, eventually you'll find what works for you. And it might differ from my views and it's totally fine. I learned from bad teachers. I learned from bad musicians. I mean, I learned that I shouldn't do, that I should ignore what they say. I learned to trust my instinct from the bad musicians that I play with. I learn not to do what they do and so on and so forth. It's, it's all about experimenting and trying. I have a vision of music that I've developed over the years. And um, who knows, actually five years from now, I may completely change, go in totally opposite directions. I, I, I embrace it. I live in the moment. I live the life. And I also fully realize that other people have different visions of music and all that is totally fine. That, that's what I mean by finding your own truth. For example, in my YouTube videos, I like to refer to a very, very good friend of mine, one of my best friends, Christian van Hamert, who's a big shot YouTuber. At least he says he is. <laughs> and uh, now he's, he's a really, really intelligent person. We have lots, a lot, and lots of debates about music. And... Um, I respect his opinions, but uh, we, while we agree on many things, there are fundamental differences in our ways of viewing music. I would say that Christian is kind of like on a bit of an extreme side. And there's actually another musician that I, a good friend of mine, his name is Charles Limburger, who, has, who is very, very, very opinionated about music as well. The three of us, all, when we get together, we often have these very geeky debates about music so christian is on one side and then cha is on another bit of an extreme side I, I consider myself to be somewhere between the two and it's very interesting every time we get together and have these like fierce fierce discussions about music hence my recommendation to go talk to everyone to question everything that you're told with that said since music and especially jazz music is about freedom freedom of expression, uh, I tend not to tell people how they should play. It's, it's such a personal thing. Personally, uh, over the past few years, I've been developing a, a teaching style that's based more on teaching from a historical perspective. Of course, I do share my opinions, but I also make it clear that they are my opinions and that people are, feel, are free to disagree with me. I think I'm in a very good position to teach from a historical perspective because I've been involved with this style of music for almost 20 years now. Right out of high school I discovered this style, so now you can guess my age. And um, yeah, for almost 20 years I've been deep, well the first few, two, two, three years were kind of like, no, 
it was pretty fairly early on that I started becoming deeply involved with uh, the practitioners of the style. I befriend, befriended lots of uh, really, really good musicians early on because I spoke French, I understood some German, so I was able to befriend people who were at the center of the style. And then through my DC music school and also through, uh, through um, concerts, I ended up working with pretty much everyone in the style, like uh, Birelli Lagren, Angelo Davar, Chavalo Schmidt, Stokla Rosenberg, Moses Rosenberg, Jimmy Rosenberg, uh, everyone, pretty much. Um, and not only did I get to work with them, I also picked their brain. Like I really, in some cases, coached them into uh, like help them explain their thoughts their ideas behind their musical process so I know the differences between all the all the best players all the the, the technique the sense of time the harmony the licks uh, the, the philosophies and everything I'm in a very good position to give very clear answers and to dispel all the myths that you may encounter and this is something that I address uh, in the in the beginner lessons one of the first things I want to address as well is the inherent flaws with my online course because it's very important to be truthful, in my opinion. And um, so the inherent flaw of my online course is that it's an online course. Like I said, I don't believe in a universal system because everyone is different and the fact that I make an online course makes it seem that it's universal when it's absolutely not. I, uh, I change my approach, my teaching approach, de depending on who I'm dealing with and what my students' goals are. For Since 2015, I've been doing a homestay program in Montreal where people from all over the world come to stay with me and spend some time with me. Some, sp some people spend a few days, some spend a week, some spend two weeks, some have spent a month, two months, some have even spent three months. And we work on music together. It's a unique program and surprisingly it's been booked since its, it, since its inception and um, I learn a lot from my students as well because we live together. I really get to see how they practice. It usually takes a day or two for me to get to know them musically and then from there I can kind of devise custom lesson plans. I would like to say that I'm very lucky because like I said, I learn, I probably learn as much as my students do. Because I learn a lot about the psychology of teaching. And when you're living together, you really get to see what they're doing. And um, what's very interesting as well is that, okay, some people, they, come, they spend like a week or two. And then they come back a year or two later and they've progressed, which makes me so happy. And then when they come back, I, I, com I change my uh, teaching approach because to reflect their, their new level. So that, in my opinion, is the best way to teach, is to adapt to your students' desires, their needs. And with an online program where everything is kind of like set in stone, you, you can't do that. So that's the main flaw of, uh, of my, my course or any online course or method books out there. That said, I targeted a very specific demographic for this course, so it does help a little bit. Like I said, it's uh, targeted towards beginners. So at least there's sort of some common starting points. Nonetheless, I think that um, the, the goals and wants of the students are very important. Here we're talking about gypsy jazz. And when you listen to gypsy jazz or read about it, it kind of seems that it's very homogenous and codified. Definitely to a certain extent it is. There's a common repertoire, even some common vocabulary or common use of concepts. But there's also the freedom to be your own person because even like uh, if you take Stokelo Rosenberg and Moses Rosenberg who are brothers, they both... Uh, have a lot in common for sure, but there are also some fundamental differences between the two. Uh, Moses Rosenberg incorporates a lot of modern bebop ideas, whereas Stokolo tends to be a little bit more traditional. And then you take another player like Angelo Debar, he has a completely, completely different style. 
his style uh, so Moses and Stoklo their their styles are based on long phrases that are really really beautiful uh, licks if you want and then you have Angelo the bar who definitely has uh, patterns but the patterns are often manipulated and he's playing a lot more by ear and uh, doing a lot of voice leading if you don't know what voice leading means, it doesn't matter but there's a lot of voice leading and a lot of his playing is based on the actual harmony because some other players like Stokolo and Moses they sometimes uh, superimpose other chords whether they know it or not uh, but that's what they do but Angelo tends to be more in the harmony and you have all these different players like Chavalo Schmidt has his own style as well so that's very important and why is that very important because as a student you should only focus on what you like some people don't even like uh, what we call gypsy jazz some people only like Django and when you talk about Django he himself had three distinct musical styles depending on the period like there's the 30s style there's the 40s like mid early 40s and then there's the late 40s until his death three distinct styles and Duvet Dunayevsky for example focused a lot on 1930s Django uh, someone like Vava Adler you can hear when he plays the Django style it's very reminiscent of the, the late the mid 1940s style so my point is the best thing you can do is to focus only on what you like there's no need to be able to do everything because that's a myth not everyone can do everything not even be really even although he comes closest why is that important because if you focus on what you like chances are you already know it you it's already familiar to you you're enjoying it and it's gonna stick uh, faster than things that you're kind of like forced to learn I hope you understand what I mean with my beginner course I'll be showing you a lot of vocabulary but maybe you don't enjoy some of it and that's where again talking about that flaw is so um, feel free to skip some of the stuff that you don't enjoy definitely don't um, I even say this in the lesson I encourage people to always experiment so don't follow my uh, lesson plan like to to a T like feel free to deviate to create your own um, practice materials as well seek outside sources when you focus on what you like you're likely to learn faster because it's automatic you're enjoying it and you, it doesn't feel like practice so that was a lot of talking and I didn't even start the actual content of this video but I think that speech was very very important let's finally get started how should we learn gypsy jazz how should beginners learn gypsy jazz it's a very big question because everyone has different goals some people just want to play rhythm and some people want to play lead many people want to play lead <laughs> uh, some people are hobbyists some are semi-professional some are full-time musicians or want to be full-time musicians so there are different um, goals and life situations out there it's so it, things will va inevitably vary if you want to learn gypsy jazz chances are it's because you heard it and you liked it and that's already a very very good start an important start it seems like an obvious thing to say and ridiculous to even say this but let me just give you an example like back in the day when i was much much younger and i was teaching anyone who wanted to take guitar lessons like I'd advertise all over the internet all, all, not, the internet wasn't really popular then but newspapers and everything so I, I would get these kinds of phone calls so someone would call me up and say yeah I'm a heavy metal player I'm a shredder and I need to learn jazz so I can get my modes under control and all that stuff and I'd be like uh, okay um, who's your favorite jazz artist and they'll be like well uh, I don't listen to jazz so that's that's very bad reason to be learning a style of music because you if you don't listen to jazz you you just cannot play jazz and that's what I believe despite what music schools tend to music schools and magazines and books tend to say if you want to learn a style of music you have to listen to that style of music it's not about the theory 
It's not about the scales, it's not about the modes or the arpeggios. It's about listening to the music and absorbing the sound so that it's part of your body and that it's in your head. The sound is in your head. Furthermore, you know, the word jazz is uh, very, is vague. Like Scott Henderson falls under the jazz ca category and so does Frank Gambelli. And they would fall under the jazz fusion category. But even within the jazz fusion styles, Scott Henderson and uh, Frank Gambelli have completely different approaches. If you look at older jazz styles like bebop, Joe Pass, George Benson, yet again, two completely different approaches. So that's why I say it's very important to focus on what you like. You discovered a style of music because you heard it. So who was it that you discovered? Uh, I don't know who it was. Maybe it's Django, maybe it's uh, Birel Lagren, Stokel or Rosenberg. Focus on them because that's, that's your first love. Roses are red, violets are blue, gypsy jazz is the way. In theory, it seems like it's a good idea to study all sorts of different styles, all sorts of different players. But in practice, if you look at the history of, and, and I have, because I worked with all these amazing DC Music School artists, I really picked their brains. The one thing they have in common is that they only focused on what, on what they loved. They followed a very natural path. They came to their own style by focusing on what they liked. So... That's one of the most interesting things about teaching, about books and everything. They, they, there's all these things that they that in theory sounds good, but in practice it's it's another world. Focus then on on reality, less on the theory. This so-called gypsy jazz style is what I consider to be a community-driven style of music. That means it's a style of music that thrives best when we play with other people. So when we get into gypsy jazz. We want to be able to play this music with other people as soon as possible, right? And the way I would suggest learning gypsy jazz is to adopt the same philosophy that a lot of the best players adopted. And it's not just exclusive to gypsy jazz. There's a lot of early jazz musicians who adopted this philosophy. It's not about scales. It's not about arpeggios. I personally almost never worked on scales or arpeggios and the same can be said for so many of the best players. The focus should be on repertoire, learning a bunch of tunes, and then developing vocabulary. Now, don't get me wrong, I have nothing against scales or arpeggios, but I've seen this all over the internet. And people would ask, how should I learn jazz? Or even, even gypsy, how should I learn gypsy jazz? And I read like comments, yeah, you gotta work on your Dorian scale, your melodic minor, you gotta work on your minor six arpeggios. Like, that's... No, 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 and no. <laughs> Let me be clear. I'm not against theory. That would be very hypocritical of me because I have an actual degree on classical, classical uh, harmony and analysis, music theory. And uh, I studied like harmony. I studied counterpoint. I studied uh, Schenkerian analysis. Look that up. So I'm very, very well versed in, in theory. What I am saying is that historically, this style of music and many other styles of music are not learned that way. They are learned through the way I described, learning repertoire and learning vocabulary. But as I said earlier, there are different ways to learn. And the important thing is not how you learn, it's that you are working towards this goal. And okay, so maybe you will have to go through theory and this and that to to help you get there, in which case it's fine. But there are some people who easily go overboard with the, the theory, like they're all talk, but no walk. You don't want to be that person. Well, let's get started. Um, repertoire building. The first thing you want to do is learn tunes. And since we're playing guitar, chances are when you're learning tunes, you're going to be learning to play rhythm as well. So you want to develop a, a decent sense of rhythm, uh, which means as steady a tempo as possible and good sound. In the beginning, most people learn like the same first few tunes like uh, minor swings, very, very popular, dark eyes, minor blues, coquette, all of me. What well, I think I just listed five songs. So those are very those are those five songs are very good songs to start with. So in volume one of my beginner series, there's a strong emphasis on uh, repertoire acquisition and rhythm playing. Ideally, you would memorize these songs, 
But if it's not possible, and it is possible, feel free to use a chart or something like that. So why is it a good idea to learn a song by heart? There are so many reasons. Now, I'm not saying that never you should never ever use charts or anything like that, but I think it's a good idea to have like a certain number of tunes committed to memory. How many? I don't know. It depends on your skill level, your goals and everything. But to give you like a kind of a counter example, for me it's a bit strange when people require a, a chart for a song they've been playing for 30 years. They, they've been playing that same song for 30 years and still needing a chart. There's something not normal with that. And if you're in that situation, then, you know, here we want to learn, right? Then if you're in that situation where you need a chart for the same song for 30, and I've, I've, I've seen this, for 30 years, you cannot progress. And here we're talking about progressing. So if you're happy with just staying at your level, then it's totally fine. Then do what you got to do. But I definitely think a lot of songs, it's, it's uh, from a musicianship point of view, it's not normal to rely to need a chart for the same song song for even five years even two years so that's one reason why you should commit a song to memory so you can internalize it but most importantly so you can focus on what's going around while you're playing and not on the the, the sheet music this is very important because in in jam sessions or in concerts accidents do happen uh, like some players might get lost and not recover and you have to hear this and then be able to adjust like in a song where if you're focusing on a song and it's uh, the lead player skips an A section goes directly to the bridge then you need to hear that and then adjust accordingly when you memorize a song you can then start to focus on also the structure of the song you can try to uh, internalize the structure of the song to figure out if it's what the form is is it A A B A A B A C is it a blues and all that stuff? And then try to internalize the, the feeling of the form in your body. Because chances are when you're reading, you're reading like chord by chord. But when you have this feeling of the form, you internalize the rhythm as well. The, the, the feeling of the, the structure. A, a good song, uh, a good example would be Sweet Georgia Brown. A lot of people have trouble knowing when to switch chords because they're they're counting and they, they they don't feel the four bars of e7 a7 d7 here what i'm doing i'm not necessarily counting but i'm feeling i've i've played this song so much and i've worked on it so much that I it's the the four four the the symmetry of the chord changes are is um it's just something that I feel naturally and I don't even have to count anymore so that's what I mean you get to focus on things like this okay so on the guitar which chord voicing should you use this is a very big topic obviously the more that you know the better but let's say you're a beginner then I tend to show beginners very simple chord shapes that are easy to memorize like minor swing i probably use this a minor six you can use different fingerings doesn't matter then d minor six and then the e7 i'll probably do this three notes you can do something like this Or I might step so on the A minor six, I'm playing these four notes, and for the E seven, I'm only playing three notes because I don't want to have this note. I mean, you could add it. I'm not going to talk about theory, but I may even simplify things further for like super beginners and just do three notes all the time. So this is A minor six, this is D minor six, but the same shape can also be E seven. So I explained the theory at one point in my beginner course, but the the thing i would do with beginners just stay, tell them all right this is minor swing just uh don't think too much just etc just accept this believe me that this is minor swing one way to play minor swing 
So a lot of this depends on the technical skill level of the student. If I see that they're a bit more advanced, then I would show them more uh, real gypsy chords or chords that are more, um, what's the word? Uh, not authentic, but uh, idiomatic, idiomatic. Because actually these chords are not very idiomatic for rhythm playing, despite popular, despite con conventional wisdom. You'll notice that Django often favored chords like this. Instead of this. And some players will also, his, Django's rhythm players use bar chords. They are like this. Actually, there are videos of them doing like this. Uh, so yeah, that's why I said the more you know, the better. So if someone's more technically advanced, then I'll go straight to the to the juicy chords. But if you're like a total beginner, then yeah, it's totally fine to just use the the non-idiomatic chords. The point is, as a beginner, you should do everything at your own pace. Don't try to take on more than you can handle. And if it has to be super simple, like simplified, by all means, go for it. But eventually, you want to expand your knowledge. Um, actually, let me tell you a story. When I when I was starting this style, um, for the most part, I'm self-taught. But one day, I was walking down the street in Montreal, and I saw a poster, a sign. There was a picture of Django, so I was like surprised. Whoa! And it says said something like, uh, "Do you want to learn gypsy jazz? Call me." So I called up the guy. It was a French dude from France, who had learned some rhythm with some gypsy players, and he was mainly a rhythm player. So when I showed up to his place, he taught me his way of playing rhythm. And I remember like one of the first lessons he taught me the chords to use for minor swing. So I learned one set of chords. I don't remember what it was. So maybe it was something like this. Something like that. So that was the first week. And then the week I go back to him, the next week I'd go back and he'd show me a new set of chords. I don't remember what it was, but he maybe he showed me something like uh, something like this. And then for the E7, he showed me something like this. And then the third week, another set. So one week at a time, like I expanded my chord uh, vocabulary. Then at one point, I was able to mix and match. And certain songs I can play, like I would have two to three options per chord. And then I can manipulate them. Okay, so you focus on the tunes and you learn on the chord, you learn the chords. But then what are the correct chords to a tune? And this is very important. This is where the Django fake book or the iReal book or whatever book you use can become problematic. I address this in detail in my course, but one thing that beginners or anyone should know is that songs can have multiple chord possibilities. The the, the official technical term is harmonic possibilities. When I say harmonic, I don't mean uh, it refers to harmony. Harmony is um, is the study of chords and chord progressions. It's a vast topic and the fact that songs can be played many different ways can lead to tricky situations at jam sessions or concerts, especially when different musicians know different versions of the same song. And sometimes the difference is so big that the different versions don't work together at all. And actually I encountered this just last week. I was at a trad jazz session in Tokyo and someone called tune what was it Danny boy yeah Danny boy and the bass player had his iPad and the piano player had her iPad or whatever they had different like apps or something and I quickly realized that the changes were so different like they were so dissonant to my ears and I, I just laid out I just stopped playing and I was stunned because none of the musicians were aware. Like they didn't, I don't know, they were so focused on their sheet music that they, and they were great musicians, but they were so focused on their sheet music that they didn't hear how like incredibly, incredibly dissonant it was. And it went on like that for the whole song, and which is why I say focus on memorizing songs. So you can focus on listening. And when I play with people, I always ask, what changes do you use if I know that a song can have different possibilities? Now, some songs have only very, very slight differences in harmonies. Not enough that it 
causes my ear to go like this like it did at the, the trad jazz se jam session like for example all of me some people at the end they might play f major to f sharp diminished instead of f minor i mean yeah it's dissonant but like it's, to me it's not like a huge deal or like um like the b section of coquette where it goes d7 to g some people might put a minor seven then to d7 like a two five one those kinds of things I don't mind because it, it doesn't really stand out so much so for a jam session those kinds of chords totally fine for a recording or for a concert like a really well-prepared concert that's where maybe we I want to agree on like the sets of changes like down to the the exact details that's not to say that you can't do passing chords and all that stuff of course you can do those things but like the basic harmonies should be should be clear if you're doing a recording or uh, a live concert. For example, like just that all of me example, I would agree with my musicians. Do we do F major to F minor or F major to F sharp diminished? Because that would uh, affect the way I I'd improvise. Me personally, it might not affect someone like my friend Christian van Hamert, because we have different philosophies. But yeah. All this to say is that if you use a book or one of those apps or someone teaches you a song, just be aware that it might not be the only way to play the song. Keep an open mind. Okay, so you've learned a bunch of tunes, like, I don't know, 10 tunes. And you can play rhythm, maybe five tunes to start with. And you can play the rhythm. What's next? Well, <clears throat> for some people, they just want to play um, rhythm. In which case, that's kind of where it stops. You just keep learning more tunes play rhythm and try to improve your sound your sense of time I have more to say about that after but let's say okay then you want to learn lead then what you want to do is this is a very interesting one you might want to learn the melody and I place emphasis on the word might you may want to learn the melody this is a bit of a tricky question because how much of the melody should you learn if you listen to a lot of jazz recordings you may notice that the musicians often don't play the, mel the melody straight. They embellish it, and sometimes for certain parts of the song, they don't even play the melody. They're like, they start improvising a little bit. That's why it's a little bit tricky. It might even be very difficult to find like the original version of the tune. Not only that, as I said, jazz musicians, they tend to like to reharmonize songs so that they're a little bit more interesting for harmonic reasons or more uh, interesting to solo over when it comes time to improvise and some jazz musicians have changed the chords to certain songs to the point where the if you were to play the 100% of the original melody it at some point it might actually not work and that I discovered for example when I was researching a song called Shine which I do teach in the, the beginner lesson series at one point and uh, at the end it goes F <laughs> F sharp diminished, that's the way most people would play it today. But that F sharp diminished is problematic. The original, original version stays on the F chord. I don't remember off the top of my head what the, what the melody is. But what I did in my lesson is I slightly changed the melody to, to fit the harmony. So things like that can happen. Another example is Django's version of Them Their Eyes. He completely changed the chords. And if you were to play the original melody, it wouldn't really fit. Um, and if you listen to Django's versions of those songs, he recorded twice. The only hint at the first part of the melody, which is just... That's kind of the only thing they hint as far as the melody is concerned. And then they kind of go their own way afterwards. So that's what? That's like 10% of the, of the melody. So the question of how much of the melody you should learn becomes tricky. Uh, my friend, again, I, I mentioned my friend a lot, Christian Van Hamer, and he has a really, really good point. We, in a debate once, it was a public setting, people could ask questions. And he said, I don't care about the melody. I just want to know what the chords are so I can improvise over it. And that upset some people. And it's like, what? You have to know the melody. And then he stumped them. He said, okay, can you sing, sing for me the full original melody of Them, Their Eyes? And nobody could do it. They could all play the chords. They could all do... But they didn't know where it went from there. So <laughs> he had a really, really good point. He must have pissed off some people there. But it's, it's a very valid point. Which is why I say it's tricky. I mean, 
I do think it's a good idea to learn melodies because I actually learned a lot from melodies. I'll talk about that after when we talk about lead. But how much of it you should learn as much as possible, whenever possible. But listen to how jazz musicians are treating mem the melodies. How much of it are they playing? Where are they improvising? Also check out, for example, uh, Django's version of All of Me. There's only one version. I think it was recorded in 1940 or 1941. Uh, it's the sax player. He plays the melody. He does da da da. Da, 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 ba, da, da. Then he only does that, and then after, the rest is kind of like improvisation. So that's another example where someone only plays like maybe 20% of the melody. That said, in my beginner series, I address this in detail, and whenever possible, I show as much as possible the original melody. So I said earlier that some people only want to play rhythm, and then that's kind of where it ends, right? But in my opinion, if you want to be a good rhythm player, you should have some notion of soloing, of improvisation, so that you can tr develop your ears to hear what the, the lead players are doing, so you can re react appropriately. The most obvious reason why this is useful is in case accidents happen. Like I said, if, if a soloist is playing a tune, and then suddenly the soloist goes to the bridge too early, if your ears can hear what the soloist is doing, then you can, and the soloist doesn't realize they went to the bridge early, then you can, boom, on the fly, play the chords of the bridge. Or, for example, you're playing with a soloist, um, and you forgot to agree on the, the chord changes, and uh, you notice that the, the soloist is consistently playing something that doesn't really match what you're playing. Let me give you an example. There's a tune called David. I think it's originally a Jewish tune, but uh, uh, gypsy musicians, they play this in church, in their Christian evangelical church. That's the A section, then the B section. So that B section, there are two ways to play this. So it goes da 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 that's one way. Another way. So if I hear, like I do one version, but the soloist is consistently doing the other, then I have the ears to change my chord, my uh, to change versions. Now it's also possible that the soloist arbitrarily chooses to do one version for one chorus and the other one for the next chorus, but like not in a regular pattern or so. That's a little bit of a more advanced concept where it's it's more of a soloing concept where you can you're free to superimpose different changes over the the existing ones. Uh, since that's an advanced soloing concept, I'll I'll not I won't talk about it for now, but uh, I just want to give you one simple example of why it's it's good to be able to hear, to understand uh, by ear what the soloists are doing. One player that likes to superimpose more uh, different changes would be Adrien Magnac, so check him out if you, if you want. Now you want to play lead, that's what everyone wants to do. It's very funny because for me, uh, I mean it's fun to play lead, but I was always more interested in accompaniment. I, it's something that I, I, uh, I worked on a lot and it's a shame that not too many people are into it. But I digress. Talk about lead. A lot of people will say, if you want to play lead, you should learn to play rhythm first. And I talk about this in a, at length in a YouTube video. It's a 90 minute video. I think it's called Secrets of Gypsy Jazz Rhythm. Look, at, look it up somewhere in my channel. And uh, obviously I'm not going to repeat what I said over that 90 minute video. But basically that statement is not true at all. You don't have to be a good rhythm player to be a lead player. You don't even have to play you can be a really really good lead player without being a good rhythm player because it's those are two different skills two different philosophies for timing and it's different techniques as well so if you're interested in lead playing just focus on lead playing now here's the thing if you have bad rhythm though chances are if you go to a jam session people won't want to jam with you people are not likely to call you unless you're such a good lead player that they want to back you up. And, and I have met some really incredible lead players who rhythm playings 
in my opinion, weren't really good. Uh, meaning that their tempo was not good, they played too loud, or the sound was not right. Um, so yeah, check out that video though. It goes without saying though, that if you try to put at least a minimum effort into developing some sort of adequate rhythm playing, then chances are then that people will call you up, say, hey, let's jam, or you get hired for, for gigs, right? So that's why you would maybe want to invest some time into developing your rhythm playing skills but that's it's a huge topic so we're talking about beginners and you want to get into lead playing you know nothing about improvisation now maybe you know a pentatonic scale and if you have a chord progression that's in the key of c oh yeah the best now you can do something with the pentatonic scale that maybe that's the kind of the extent of the knowledge you have maybe even not like I said, I've, I've taught people from scratch, so I know exactly how it goes. When you're, when you're dealing with songs, with chord progressions, that are, where all the chords are in the same key, it's what we call a diatonic chord progression. Diatonic means that it belongs to the same key. And therefore, that A minor, C major pentatonic thing works. And doesn't mean it's going to be a good solo, but theoretically, everything you, all the notes you play, for the most part, will, will work. From a theoretical point of view but then in a lot of jazz songs you have chords that are non-diatonic meaning that you have chords that are coming from outside keys or elsewhere and your a minor c major pentatonic no longer works and that's a good example of this would be uh, all of me it's in the key of c then the second chord right away it's an e7 and then goes to a7 these two chords do not belong to the key of c and your c major pentatonic suddenly it doesn't really work. So what are you supposed to do over those chords? And this is where things get very, very complicated. It's a vast topic, and I could spend hours talking about it. And I want to take this moment to also tell you to, to check out some of my other videos on my channel, because there's a lot of information that crosses over, and there's sometimes I go into like explicit detail on certain topics. So you might find information in other videos that, that might help you in this department. The subject of improvisation is vast. There are so many system, systems out there, and I can't claim to say that this X or Y system is the best one. But as I said early on, my system is not coming from scales or arpeggios. I rarely practice scales or arpeggios, yet I know them very well because I, I got them the other way around. It's kind of like a language. Most kids, when they learn their mother tongue, they don't start with the grammar. They start with vocabulary. And then eventually at school, if they go to school, they start to they study the grammar. So that was exactly the same thing for me. I, I started with the vocabulary. I worked a lot on acquiring a lot of lines, beautiful lines to play over these songs so that it sounded idiomatic. And then eventually my, I got to a point where I was able to um, deconstruct the lines to their essential components. And that's where I got the scales and arpeggios. So I'm, I'm very well versed in arpeggios and scales without really having practiced them. That says something about the myth about having to study your scales and arpeggios. Because if you do it the other way around, from if you study the grammar first, just because you know the scales or arpeggios doesn't mean you can play the beautiful lines. And I know, I know beautiful lines is subjective, but I've seen this so many times. People work on like a song like Jangology. You know, doing things like this. Okay, it all works, but it doesn't sound anything like, like Django. You know, he's playing lines. I think that was a good solo, but that was kind of inspired by one of Django's versions. Anyway, yeah, if you learn vocabulary, you'll learn the scales and arpeggios eventually, but you'll also have really beautiful lines that when you play, someone who knows this style is like, ah, this person really knows the style. And speaking of some of my pre previous videos that has crossover information, I, I suggest you check out the one that was released before this one for Django's birthday. I talked about how I learned this style of music. I'm actually, for the most part, self-taught in this style because I had no choice. There were no teachers in, in those days. So I had to learn the way I learned, 
But I quickly found out that that's actually the way that a lot of these uh, early jazz players played. Like, uh, uh, when I mean early jazz, like people born uh, a certain time, like first half of the 20th century or even early second half of the 20th century, like George Benson, Pat Martino, uh, Wes Montgomery, uh, Django Reinhardt, of course, they all learned this way through community and uh, acquiring vocabulary and learning songs. So you have to focus on the players that you like. For me, back in, the, in those days, in the early 2000, or actually 2000, 2001, 2002, it was uh, Django, uh, Stokla Rosenberg, and Jimmy Rosenberg. Why those three players? And also Rafael Faiz, but he only had one album that I could find. But why those players? Because those were the only albums that I could find in those days. It was uh, Gypsy Jazz, as we know it today, was not what it was then. I used to be with it, but then they changed it, so now I'm no longer with it. What I was doing is I was, um, I remember, like there was a song, uh, Minor Blues, I had trouble improvising in a way that sounded convincing. So I, I studied Django solo and I took some of the licks, so that's how I developed my first set of uh, beautiful lines. But that's not enough. I'll eventually make a video on transcribing, how to transcribe, how to lift solos, but uh, it's, a, it's a big topic. But what I did is um, I took some, some patterns that Django did and I created some licks with them. And then I would copy and paste them across different tunes. So like on minor blues, I had this lick that I created based on a Django pattern. And I know it works on minor swing. So it's not enough to copy a line, you have to understand the line. Now how much of it should you understand would depend on your skill, skill level. I didn't always understand everything in the beginning. The most important, the most, let's say if we start from scratch, the, the, the most basic thing you need to do is if you learn this line, like you heard someone do it. And you, you have to tell yourself, okay, that's over a G minor chord. Then you figure out the notes. Then you tell yourself, okay, that works over a G minor chord. Then you do it over A minor, you do it over D minor. So that, that would be like the most basic step required. In beginning stages, if, if you have trouble understanding why it works, it's just enough to do this. Spend some time doing this, eventually you'll start to hear it. Uh, and at this point, it's, it's I want to say the following. I don't want you, as students of music... I think it's always a good idea to, to try. I always encourage people to try. Don't be in a situation where you say, am I allowed to do this? Don't ask that question. Just do it. Try it. If, it, if, it, if you try it, if it sounds good to you, then keep it. And our tastes evolve. There are a lot of things that I used to do back in the day that I no longer do because it no longer sounds good to me. And that's, it's, it's totally normal. It's part of the evolution process. Our tastes change, and then you, we discard what we what we don't like anymore, what we don't think is necessary. And if you find something that you like to do, and someone tells you, "Ah, oh, why are you doing that?" Um, I wouldn't necessarily dismiss everything they say. You should definitely ask them why they think that way, and it might, might be even from me. I was like, "Ah, oh, I don't like what you, th that phrase that you're doing," and I may tell you why. And I, I have done this before, though. Actually, someone asked me sent me, uh, played something for me. I said, well, you know, this seems a little bit strange to me. That's my opinion. I gave my, my reasons why, but I did say, but you know what? If, if, you're really, if you really love what you're doing, keep it. There's no problem. Do it. I'm not here to tell you not to do it. I gave you my reasons why, but keep doing what you're doing. And who knows, like uh, maybe two years down the road, your ears will change, your ears will change and you'll maybe understand where I'm coming from, maybe you won't, it doesn't matter. It's just do it. Since people learn differently, I can't tell you exactly how you should go about developing vocabulary, but you should definitely be checking out some of your favorite artists. Um, I mean, ideally you do it by ear, but if you, if you don't have the possibility to do this, then you can find a transcription or something, ask someone to transcribe for you. But 
the fo the the important thing is that you're 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 making the effort to check out your favorite artists and to learn the lines that you like. You don't have to learn entire solos. You can just learn bits and pieces that you like. So you take a song that you're working on, let's say it's minor swing, and you don't know what to do over the E7. Then check out your favorite artist and see what they're doing over that E7 chord. And then you work that out, you practice it, then you transpose it to different song to different keys and different songs. So that's the concept behind my In The Style Of series on DC Music School where I've produced lessons for like uh, Chavalo Schmidt, Birel Legrand, Stokla Rosenberg, Jimmy Rosenberg, Moses Rosenberg, like all, all the best players in Gypsy Jazz and also like bebop players. They're playing over backing tracks of standards. So you can take the song that you're working on and you can even do this if you're as a beginner and you just focus on the, the ideas you can, for example, take the lick note for note, or the if you have the, the, the ability to analyze, then you can take just the concept. So even if you're taking a lick from uh, Birelli that's like super technical, like way beyond your technical level, but you understand the concept, take the concept. Like he's doing, I don't know, uh, over an A7 chord, yeah. Birelli, something that he does is play a B flat minor six arpeggio, yeah. but he does like a super virtuosic B flat minor six. <laughs> like that but you don't have the technique don't just take the notes of the b flat minor six arpeggio right make it adapt it to your own level so that's what i mean by about uh by uh acquiring vocabulary so on my tc music school website all of these examples are transcribed so then i mean like i said do it by ear if possible but if not then refer to the transcription so the bare minimum is to just know that x lick works over Y chord, like this, works over G minor, then be able to transpose it. That's like the bare, bare essentials. If you're a slow learner, it's totally fine. Just do this and try to do it on different songs every day, uh, on the songs that you know, like you can do this on minor blues, minor swing, dark eyes. I talk about this in the beginner lesson series, but yeah, that's, that's a good way to start. You always have to do things in manageable chunks. Now, if you're a faster learner or you have kind of a theoretical background, you, you're somehow able to uh, understand the, the, the lick and strip it to its bare, like bare essentials, like the, the main components, then good for you. By all means, do it. In the uh, beginner lesson series, a lot of the lines that I show in the beginning, anyway, are very basic and very easy to relate to the chord so there's not, not nothing fancy going on but so let's say you're able to uh, decompose the lick so what should you what you what should you do with that for example this lick you're gonna realize if you have the background to do so that it's actually a G minor arpeggio and then has this thing this thing it's targeting the root then you can be creative and say oh okay so this is the root G where else is the root it's here it's here what else is there in this lick there's it's going it's a G minor arpeggio but it's also going through the six so then I can play a G minor arpeggio starting from the root here play the six or I can be creative I can play the six the first time around but not the second time around or vice versa I can play I can do the same thing but skip the fifth um, so on and then there's also this chromatic from the root to the sixth so then, okay, here's the root to the sixth. See? See? I would suggest that, um, check the link below. You, um, you'll you be able to see everything that I play on Sound Slice. So you have the, the transcription so you can follow along. Isn't technology great? That's what I mean when you break down a lick to its like uh, bare essentials bare essentials get it i'm not even a dad and i'm making dad jokes so that's my way of uh, acquiring vocabulary 
So you repeat this process, you learn more and more tunes, you expand your vocabulary, and eventually, like, it's, you, you start to develop your own style. And if, if you do what I said about, like, uh, breaking down the licks to their essential ingredient, the, the basic ingredients, then you can actually start to really improvise in the moment. You can learn the scales and the arpeggios that they come from, and then you can manipulate them. For the most part, this is how a lot of the best players in this style learned. So how they get there is not important, but the, 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 that, the, that's the... How they get there is not important because you can go through theory, you can use tab books, whatever, transcriptions, but the important is that thing that, that you do get there. Eventually, when you've learned a number of songs, you start to subconsciously hear or um, uh, recognize patterns and that's when you become very, very familiar with the style. And then it becomes easier and easier to learn. For example, I told you when you, if you have like the two or three different ways to play the same chord in different positions of the neck, then you will be automatically, you will have the skill to play in different keys. Uh, in all 12 keys. It's not something that I recommend you practice right away. Why? I mean, you could practice if you wanted to, but for me, instead of practicing a song in all 12 keys, I'd rather learn 12 songs, 12 new songs. And I will only do this 12 key practice later on when I'm a little bit more advanced, which is something I do do these days, but not when you're a beginner. That's my opinion anyway. When you have the ability to play a chord in three or two or three, let's just say two positions, let's say E7. You have E7 here. And you have E7 over here. Now you have two ways. So you're playing a song like minor swing. E7 there. And let's say you're playing a song like Dark Eyes. Oh, it's the same shape. It's an A7. And then it goes to D minor. And I actually wouldn't play this side, but I'm just doing this as an ex to, point, uh, to illustrate a point. Then you realize, wait. It's the same movement in minor swing, right? It's the same exact movement, same chord shapes. So this leads me to the next thing. At one point, it would be beneficial not to look at songs in terms of A minor, D minor, like minor swing, E7, but in terms of how everything relates to the root chord, like A minor. And we have theoretical systems for this. We call this... Uh, we use Roman numerals, one, four, five. So it could be useful to learn this kind of theory, to know terms like turn around, uh, one, five, one, two, five, one, one, six, two, five, one. Little basic uh, terminology that's very common in jazz music. I, I will explain, I explained this in the beginner series. But anyway, so when you can relate everything to the key, then suddenly you can play in every different, all sorts of many different keys. <laughs> Sorry, uh, and you also recognize the patterns. How every song is actually the same. Like minor swing, minor blues, and dark eyes are the same three songs with the same three chords: one, four, and five. Now, okay, I know that in dark eyes A7, there's a version that goes to B flat, goes to the flat six, but the original version is just five, one, five, one, four, one. Five one, it's the same one four five. In different orders, of course. And minor swing is one four five one four one five one. And then turn around. Minor blues one one four one five. You see, the same song, when you can start to recognize the patterns that way, then you can see why it becomes so much easier to learn songs like on the fly. I can just listen to a song once for the most part, especially in the swing styles and just get the whole chord progression like that. So let's look at a tune like All of Me. Just the first two chords. One, then it goes to this, E7. Uh, jazz musicians, they, ta they tend to call this three dominant but some theorists will say, oh, actually it should be called the five, the secondary dominant of the six, but that's such a bother that three dominant is easier. 
for communication purposes. So okay, you learn ah one to this. Where else does that happen? It happens in a song called uh, "I Wonder Where My Baby Is Tonight" in G. Da, 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 da. See, that movement also happens in uh, "Sunny Side of the Street." Da, 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 da. So that's why it's very important. It's not very important, but it's very useful to learn in this system. Instead of looking at the chords at face value like this, you go back a little bit and look at the whole chord progression and analyze in terms of Roman numerals. A lot of players like uh, Birel Legrand, for example, they don't know these Roman numerals system because they never learned the, the theory, but trust me, they know the chord progressions. As soon as you do something like this, they understand right away. They just don't have the words to explain it. Other examples, like uh, the B section of Coquette, it goes D7, G, D7, A7. So in terms of Roman numerals, that's what we call a one dominant to the four, to the two dominant, to the dominant, to the five. That happens in the exact same progression happens in honeysuckle rows, but now in the key of F, one dominant, And in honeysuckle rows, you may learn a, like a move like this, a chord movement that goes like this. Ah, oh, sorry. So this is a very typical chord movement from the, the four to the two dominant. So you can do the exact same thing in coquette. That's why it's very useful to learn in that way. So if you learn this way uh, and you, you, you uh, follow a lot of the advice that I'm giving you, chances are, and of course you have to practice a lot, it's many hours of practice unfortunately, uh, but eventually your ears will, de will develop and you'll be able to hear things. You hear voices in your head. That's kind of the system that I uh, that I use for improvisation. I, I don't think so much about any the theory. It's all about playing a note first with my I put my note my finger anywhere, and then I know it's over A minor, it's a minor swing, and I hear things already. I hear many things right now in my head. I hear da 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 do da 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 da. This was my starting point. I can hear something else. I like that. Uh, so that, that happens. I'm, I'll, I'll make a video about this process because it's actually like learning a language. I've talked about it in uh, in other videos, so check out my other videos, but I can talk about it some more in another video. The, the, the difference between learning how to improvise and learning a language. And this is something I'm, I would say that I'm kind of an expert at because I've been learning languages since I was a kid. I'm not like an expert at languages, but I've acquired a number of languages and I've been working on improvisation. I see a lot of uh, parallels between the two. So in this style of music, that's how a lot of the best players learned. And I, I said it before, like some people know practically no theory and some people know a lot. I know a lot. Some people know a little bit. It doesn't matter. It's the important thing is that you adopt this way of learning where you focus a lot on repertoire and vocabulary. And if you have to learn theory to help with the learning process, please, by all means, do it. The only thing I say is not to go overboard because I see a lot of people talk the talk. They like use on forums. They write so much about the theory, but then when it's time to play, they can't play. Talking the talk, walking the walk. What do you want to do? I think most of us want to walk the walk, right? So you have to do what I what I say. What I I think you have to follow the advice that I gave you, and it's the advice that a lot of the best teachers would would give as well. But um, <clears throat> what I mean to say is don't go overboard with the theory because I've seen that happen as well. Like people, I'll, I'll play this lick. 
And people say, okay, so it's starting on the on the third, and then it goes to the major seventh with an enclosure pattern that goes major seventh to the ninth to the root. Like, wait, who cares? Just just practice this. You can you even play it? Now do it over A minor. I know what each note represents over in this lick, but I'm not even thinking about it. I just that's what I mean about going overboard. Walk the walk, don't talk the talk. Or walk the walk and learn to talk the talk. Be able to do both, but don't just focus on talking the talk. Live the life, yo. So that's what I do with my uh, beginner series. If it interests you, please check it out. Um, I go everything in really explicit, explicit detail and I explain things very slowly. I explain everything from a historical point of view so that I explain where this song comes from, why people do this and that, who does this and that. And um, right now, as of this date, we've only released volume one. We will release volume two next month or maybe in two months, we'll see. And there'll be multiple volumes. Oh, and there's actually one more thing I want to talk about, or as we say in Canada, a boot. Hey guy, it's a boot time. I mentioned earlier that I learned a lot from melody. So let me give you a few examples of how I learned a lot about improvisation from melodies. If you take, uh, for example, there's so many things you could do, but I'll just give you a few examples. Like already all of me, if you just do this, this is what voice leading is. It's connecting uh, the chords smoothly instead of doing E, C major, down to E major here. That would be bad voice leading. This is good voice leading. So I learned about good voice leading. But then one thing that particularly uh, changed my life, I remember this as a, as a breakthrough moment for me, is over the A7 chord. Goes to D major, D minor here on the note G. It's like a sus. I love this phrase so much, and I analyze it. So I told myself, "All right, it's A7 going to D minor." Well, then I tried to plug it in in dark guys in minor swing. So. example of why it's cool to learn melodies you can find little cool melodies licks um, you also learn about sensitive notes still within all of me for example the, there's this chord progression at the, that happens a lot in gypsy jazz tunes like in the key of C it goes F F sharp diminish or F, F minor then to C then to a7 this chord progression you find in a lot of songs and a lot of uh, gypsy jazz players myself included we tend to play so many notes like big arpeggios but if you just look at the melody very nice there's another tune uh, it's called my melancholy baby it goes instead of these big big arpeggios right so that's pretty cool because you learn, uh, how do you say, a melodic way of improvising rather than playing these long, intricate lines. And sometimes simple melodies are beautiful. So that's it. Thank you very much. Please like, subscribe, share. It will allow me to make more videos.